All right, welcome back to the Flipping Junkie podcast. I've got a good friend, Bill Allen, on the show today. Really looking forward to talking to him about what's coming, right? Everybody's wondering what's happening uh, with real estate, what might happen with the market, the economy, all that kind of good stuff. And uh, Bill told me that he knows. So <laughs> welcome to the show, Bill. That is the best intro ever. Let me just grab my crystal ball right over here, <laughs> shake it up, and we'll figure out what's coming down the pipe for, for all of us. Right, right. Yeah, nobody, nobody actually knows, but we're, we're going to, you know, talk and dig into a little bit about, uh, you know, the conversation that's been happening with within uh, Bill's group and uh, all of that kind of good stuff. But for the people that don't know uh, you, Bill, I find that kind of hard to imagine that there are people listening, but they might not know about you. You want to share your story real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there, I'm sure there's uh, millions of people out there that have no idea. Who yeah, I was I kidding. I know. I appreciate it, though. It's flattering. <laughs> Um, I, so I, I don't know, I'm a I, engineering background. I think it might help for some of the stuff that we talk about, like a data nerd. Um, I was a mechanical engineer at Georgia Tech and then I went into the Navy. I flew for, I'm in my 19th year right now. I'm a reservist. So I did 15 years of active duty and I'm almost done my time for retirement. I uh, flew helicopters and airplanes for the Navy and, um, got my start in real estate just by moving around from city to city. I had a commanding officer tell me one time that, uh, he made money everywhere he went. He bought a house everywhere he went and made money. So I thought, what could I lose uh, buying a house? So I bought a house in 2006 in San Diego, and I, I lost a lot when I sold that house in 2009. Um, but that was like my intro to uh, to real estate and just started like buying houses and moving and then renting them out. I thought I wanted to be a landlord. Um, then I discovered flipping. In fact, uh, I know that I've shared this a bunch, Danny, but I, I found your book, uh, Flipping Houses Exposed. And that was one of the first books that I ever picked up. I was really cheap. I, I wouldn't buy, um, buy even many books at that time. I would go to the library, have a library card, would go to RIA meetings um, and just try to learn as much as I can, like a lifelong learner. But uh, that book was like 99 cents on my Kindle or something. So I, I was like, I'm willing to sit down 99 cents to see what this guy has to say. You were and, my only sale. That was the only one that <laughs> ever sold. No. Yeah. Uh, I... That, that really changed the way that I looked at things, to be perfectly honest. I was in a world of buying from realtors and, um, and off the MLS, like one house a year or something as a rental, and I would fix it up. And it, to understand that like sellers would take a discount and you just kind of told, if, if anybody is listening to your podcast and hasn't bought that book, it's a huge mistake because it's like telling the story over, I think it was like 34 weeks uh, of you just pounding all of your leads you like talked about every single lead that came in how they found it what they were saying what they wanted for the house what the arv was and to understand that people were selling and some of the deals that you got in that book at pennies on the dollar it was really eye-opening for me so i kind of went down this path of exploring that and uh i want to be a flipper so i was uh trying to flip 12 houses a year got around some people that were doing a lot of deals and just realizing that i was kind of undershooting my my potential and so I uh, started a company uh, flipping and wholesaling houses, basically followed along with what other people were doing. And um, I got to the point where I was doing, you know, hundreds of houses a year in the company. So it was like one deal a year, then to 67 uh, deals we did that first year, and then 135, then 187, and just went from there. Um, we scaled back a little bit. I mean, maybe we talk about that some, but um, this year we'll probably do 60 deals or something like that, 60, 70 transactions and uh, made some changes last year with big overhead and a lot of uh, expenses to just a little bit less work and uh, kind of lower overhead type business now. Nice, I wanna explore that a little bit. And I'm, I'm all just super impressed always with how quickly you, you grew, you know, your business and you grew in that. But not only that, but how much other things you got into and you have a family and, uh, and, and all the things that you've done in the short amount of time really has always impressed me and and I've been curious as to to how you've been able to to do all that because you're you're also I guess go ahead and share yourself like what other uh you the mastermind and then flip hacking live and you want to go ahead and share a little bit about those things yeah so I, I was I I was a paying member of seven figure flipping when it started Justin Williams and Andy McFarland put together this program called seven figure flipping I paid twenty five thousand dollars to jump in, and that's that is what helped me um, grow. There's people in that room that were doing way more than me, thinking way bigger. And then um, I, mean, I, I still remember when you showed up at the, the house in San Diego. It was like your book that 
really got me to a place of, of doing that, listening to your podcast, all that stuff. It was like a celebrity showed up to the San Diego house, right? And I, I you know, I, you, um, all, I don't know, use your websites and all those things uh, that whole time. So um, and just getting to meet people like you and other people in the industry that have been doing it for a really long time allowed me to grow the business as fast as I did. So I think that's one thing that really helped. I had the opportunity to buy that company in July of 2019. So I am the owner of Seven Figure Flipping Now. I bought it from Justin and uh, been able to put on Flip Hacking Live myself for the last two years. And this will be our third year coming October uh, 2021 down in Orlando. And uh, that's been a lot of fun. So I do that. We have a team of like 22 people now or so in Seven Figure Flipping. And we launched a multifamily mastermind that has a couple more people too recently. So there's like a lot of that stuff going on. And I, I bought a farm recently and we did a farmer's market in like five days. We put together this farmer's market that did like $40,000 in sales in three hours. Wow. So just, we, yeah, we had like five, 600 people show up to the two acre pasture that I put it on in my backyard. And it's just, I asked people what they wanted. It, I said, if we started the farmer's market, would you show up? And what would you want there? And then I just created it exactly what they wanted and they came. And so it's really an easy concept, I think, with marketing is ask people what they want and give it to them. Um, but a lot of people just try to figure out what they want and then try to slam it down other people's throat. So who did, who did you um, ask? I mean, I'm really like, I don't know why you got the farm and then like, what made you think, hey, let me like, who were you talking to? Yeah. So I, I, so the story is very simple. On the day after 4th of July, we had all this produce that was starting to, we, we have a box CSA, a, a subscription box that we, that we planted an acre and a half garden and we harvest uh, produce for our neighborhood. I wanted to get to my neighbors a little bit and I wanted to tax right off on my farm because hmm. um, we were spending money on ATVs and tractors and horses and stables and barns and all that stuff, right? So I wanted to write it off as a good real estate investor should do, but I needed income. So I've said, well, if I get, you know, 30 families to pay me a thousand bucks for the year and we deliver produce to their door, then that'll be income and I can write off a bunch of other expenses. So we did that. And then we had lots of extra. And me and my son, Will, he's seven now. We were sitting out front and I posted on my neighborhood page. Here we have, we're setting up a pop-up shop of uh, produce, like organic produce. We don't spray anything. It's, it's grown right here in the neighborhood. And five people showed up on the 5th of July. And I was like, man, this is... We need more traffic, right? And so a baker friend of mine showed up and she, and she said she was selling at another farmer's market and it's too, it's kind of a far drive and it's driving her nuts. I said, well, if I set one up behind the house, would you invite some of your customers and maybe some of your friends that also sell stuff that we could set something like that up? She's like, yeah, that'd be awesome. I would love that. So I just posted a group here, a local Facebook group. So it's called I Heart Spring Hill in Spring Hill, Tennessee. There's 29,000 people in the group. And I just asked the question, if we had to a farmer's market in Spring Hill, there, by the way, there's already a farmer's market in Spring Hill on Thursday afternoons from four to seven that the city puts on. And, um, but nobody knows about it. It's not tra heavily trafficked. It's not very good. And I hope they don't listen to this. Probably. And uh, so I just asked, said, would you come? And they said, yes. Uh, and they said, this is what we'd like to see here. All these different things. It was all food, right? All food. Said most farmers markets I go to is like 70% earrings, crafts, things like that, 30% like real food and farmers. And that's why I don't usually go back. So and that seemed to be the theme. And people don't want to drive 15 minutes to Franklin. They don't want to drive 15 minutes south to Columbia to go to those markets. Uh, they want to sell something local. So I uh, in four days, I had to call a bunch of vendors. I had to sell people over the phone, use all the skills that I know of uh, negotiation and convincing people that this is going to be really good. And then we set it up in four days. We had, you know, 18 vendors, 400, some people, we might have five or 600 people come. Um, there was line just way down the street of cars trying to get into the parking lot. And so, uh, I asked there, and then I funneled all those people to a private Facebook group that I set up for the market. And they're allowing me to post in their big group and share my, my page in there and stuff like that. And now we have 2,500 people that are members of our private Facebook group and it's growing by hundreds a day. So it's been interesting to see the same thing. You can, you can do the same thing in real estate or any other business. So um, I, I think your question was like, how do you get going so fast? And I think you just, I knew that I needed to capture that market when it was hot. Like I knew I needed to cap those people were, they saw that post. If I waited three weeks to set it up, it wouldn't have taken off like it did. I just had to just go do it. And I think a lot of people just wait too long to take action. Um, they wait till everything's perfect. 
and we had a lot of things wrong. I had, well, I had to call the city on Tuesday morning after Monday was a holiday and get try to get a permit, make sure I did everything right. I got permission and uh, we just ran with it and did it. That's awesome. Yeah, and I think that the story might seem to some people as being a little bit ir irrelevant, right? To, to flipping or real estate and all that kind of thing. But I think, like you said, I mean, it just show, goes to show with a, a very solid example of how you have grown so quickly is because you are taking action, right? You probably make quite a few mistakes. It doesn't always work out perfect. But the fact that you're taking action is what causes change. Right. Sitting there worrying about whether to do this or that doesn't really get you anywhere except for all jammed up. And, and just uh, that was a very quick example of how you've been able to do that. Yeah, I hate to throw my CPA under the bus, but I talked to him today and he said to me, he's like, man, I've been trying to come up with this course. I have this course in my head that I want to sell because so many people come to me and I can't do all of their taxes, but I can they don't need me. Like I can just teach them some tax strategy and stuff like that. Um, ahead of time and he's great cpa amazing right and i said to him i said look you're trying to create perfect like he's just he's telling me all the reasons why he can't instead of one reason why he can and i think that's what we all do it's all it's just it has to be perfect i have to understand everything i was that way i guess a big problem for me too i i wanted to know everything i wanted to have, i'm a i'm a information seeker and i the data analyst and nerd right so up front i wanted to understand exactly how the transactions went I wanted to understand what would happen if I couldn't fulfill uh, a contract that I signed that I said I would buy their house and I wouldn't be able to wholesale it. Maybe I didn't have the money at the time or whatever happened. I wanted to know everything that could possibly happen. And that's what stopped me for years, like two years. And when I realized that that imperfect action and just going um, and being a, like a quick start and action taker, it will trump everything. Like you, You'll figure it out when your back's against the wall and you need to find a solution to a problem, you'll find it or find the person who knows and, and ask them. So, right. Uh, I think that's a big thing for new investors and even even experienced investors when they go into a new space. Yeah, because I think that that experience, it's interesting that you say that even experienced investors, because I think even recently for me, I've experienced situations where I'm like, you know, I've learned that lesson in the past and I feel like I just already kind of am operating that way, you know, and we can we can overcome that and then face it in another you know, iteration of our growth in business and in life and not realize that we're back doing the same thing or stuck in the same spot, if that makes sense. But um, let's, let's talk a little bit about what's coming, because I think that that's sort of when I asked you flip hacking live this year, what do you guys, what, what's the main focus of it? Do you want to explain a little bit of what that is? Yeah. So it's a, uh, it's pretty good timing because yesterday I had a call with the event team and staff and uh, our planning team. And I'm not very good like wordsmithing stuff. So I said to them, I said, I have this concept in my head that I really want to figure out how we can present on because I think so many people are really asking the question, like what's what's coming up, right? Like what's, where are we going? What direction? Not just the real estate, like the economy itself, right? And then how does it affect real estate? What else is happening? So I, we came up with this concept of what's now and what's next. So every year we typically present on what's working in our businesses, right? Right now. So the people get up there and they share Here's my data, here's my KPIs, here's all the contracts I'm doing, here's the skills that I'm using, here's all this stuff that's working today. And I always feel like those that are sitting in the audience a lot of times are, they can see what's working today, but they may be one step behind like implementing and getting that going. So by the time somebody has an incredible success with cold calling as an example, it's, it's like, the early adopters are seeing great success. They're sharing their early adoption numbers, but the later comers, the people that are seeing it then, six months, one year later, are going to then jump in and it starts to get saturated. So a lot of what I'm trying to get our speakers to promote or present on is what's next. Like what's coming next? Like where do they see things going and how are they preparing themselves in their business for that? So we just did a virtual event last weekend and Terry Berger, who you, you know, Terry, he gave a presentation on the market. And this guy studies the market intensely and anything that he does, he does really, really well. So I trust him a lot in, in listening to him. So he gave a presentation on where the market is and where it's possibly going and where to look for data on that. And I think that's the kind of stuff that I really want to spend time on at this event is Let's say, because it, it's the middle of October, right? We still have three months for the rest of the year and then, and then 
you know, the 12 months after that. So um, kind of what's, what's, what's the next thing that people are thinking about? What's the, what's the, what, how are they going to get a leg up on their competition? They're a very competitive market, right? It's, it's really competitive. Like we had a call for, with an apartment team that I have today and we were just saying, man, we haven't gotten a deal in like two months and we're putting in 30, 40 LOIs and getting nothing, nothing accepted. Same with our, our houses, the single family houses, it's ultra competitive. People are paying a lot, a lot of money for houses right now. So what should we be doing next? So that's the kind of concept, like what's working now, we'll still share a lot of that, uh, but what are we thinking about what's coming up next? And how can we get prepared for it ourselves and our uh, personal lives, our mindset, things like that, and our business. Nice, nice. So who who's presenting all of this? What, what Who are the types of people? I mean, is this a pitch fest? What is this? Uh, yeah, so uh, great question. No, it's, it's it's not a pitch fest. The you know the, the event. If you, if you guys haven't been there and you're listening, the the event is really operators. So there's not a lot of um, bigger name speakers. Uh, I had I actually we just hired a marketing director like three months ago. Uh, actually, it's it's like six months ago now. It's in January, so my, my my entrepreneur math is coming in. We he said we gotta I gotta know the speakers. I got to know who's speaking and exactly what they're speaking on so I can promote this event. And I said, the only reason why you would need the speakers is because they would have an audience that other people would know to get them to buy tickets, right? I think 90% of the people that step on stage you'll never heard of before. You will have never seen. And it's just because they quietly do business at a very high level and they're members of our mastermind. Group. And they're also willing and open to share. They don't know that they shouldn't share everything. Like they don't know that they shouldn't uh, tell you exactly what they're doing and give you their follow-up sequence and all of that stuff. They don't just don't know that they shouldn't share that. And I, I, I require them to share it if they're going to step on stage. And so it's just, it's other investors that are doing things at a very high level that are, have a system, a process, or something that's really working for them, or they, they have the history and background to give you advice on what to potentially do next or what they're thinking about doing next. Um, and they just come on stage and share all that stuff. So it's really just a presentation of a bunch of other operators that are out there doing business all around the country at very high level that are willing and open to share um, what they're doing. So I, I tell a lot of people, if they come there, they should be able to implement, if you're going to present on our stage and you're going to come listen to that, you should be able to implement all the things that they're, they're talking about without any, buying anything extra. If you wanted to, you could leave there and you could go set all that stuff up. And they shouldn't leave something out or make you go to a website or a landing page or something like that to go find, you know, the next steps and have to buy something. So it's really um, nobody there that speaks for us uh, from our mastermind group has something to sell uh, or anything like that. Obviously, we do have a mastermind program that we invite people uh, into. We have different things that we do, but um, you can come to this event and just come to this event and leave and create a um, million dollar business without anything else. Um, and, and people have. And I've been there a couple of times and, and it's, it's not one of the, those things where you, here's a taste. If you want more, or if you actually want to get this, you need to join the group to get this. And that's not really at all what it's all about. And you had said that, you know, the, the presenters, they don't know that they shouldn't share it. And I, I, you know, the times that I was there and I do know a lot of the people that, you know, present like Terry and, and it's, I think it's not, not that they don't know, that they shouldn't share those things, but they're willing to because they know that they get that from others, right? They share and then they in return receive on as well from other people that present and other people in the group. So it's, it's really a beautiful thing. And then to be willing to share those things, I was always blown away by, you know, this is the kind of stuff that we're sharing somewhat in the mastermind and it's being shared to the whole event. And, and it's just really cool because it really is about giving and it's about, you know, taking, having actionable stuff. And I, I love that it's, it's people that quietly operate their businesses because they're facing new challenges and new things freshly and then can share that information with, with people. Whereas if you have, you know, people selling courses and things like that, sometimes they're pretty far removed from the day to day and it, it ends up being sort of high level, high level skimmed stuff. And so I appreciate yeah. that it's not. No, you said, I mean, Terry did a, a presentation on hiring last year and it was so valuable that, I mean, you could follow it exactly to a T, hire extremely well. We, we took it and revamped a lot of our hiring process, stuff like that. Like, what do, what do people need? And you're right. It's, uh, 
it's we say like it's almost like at one of our mastermind meetings that is open to the public where you get to come in and kind of see behind the curtain because you're right we, uh, people are sharing the stuff that we're talking about in the closed door meetings that they they wouldn't normally share and it's something about getting on that stage is in, in front of all these people is like all right i just have to tell them everything and they do and it's really cool to see that and uh, it's the abundance mentality and there's only i mean was there six or seven hundred people in the audience so and um it's not you know it's not you know the thirty thousand house flippers that are out there uh that come to this event it's just a, a small number of, of people that actually take the time fly down there buy a ticket get a hotel all that stuff we know it's a commitment and uh we try to give them their money's worth in the first like presentation or two so yeah what i appreciate about that is it's not this um come into a, a town have a free two day weekend kind of thing and have people call their credit card companies, you know, in order to go to the next level kind of deal. Uh, you know, this is, this is definitely high value. And that's why I have you on the show. Um, not only because you're a friend, but also because of what it is. And I believe uh, in what you guys do and share, I want to, to transition into talking a little bit about what you had said regarding your own company. And you had talked about looking at some of the numbers and, and, uh, and, and, you know, reducing, like not shooting for doing more deals, but just, you know, kind of, uh, you know, creating a more efficient company with lower overhead. And do you mind sharing any of those details? Because I think it's something that a lot of people are looking at right now with a little bit of uncertainty and uh, just wanting to, to do less and, and make more. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share that stuff because I, there's, you know, I think decisions and market trends and the people that you have, there's a lot of factors that come into all this stuff. We were a team of 15 to 20 people at a million dollar payroll. We were doing a little over $3 million in gross profit, all of that stuff. And, um, and so what, I, what, we, what we tried to do to be perfectly open and transparent is we tried to like roll out and go to a national wholesaling type company where I bought seven figure flipping. I knew that I had a pretty big email list of other investors. Um, so my, what our thoughts were, could we build this huge buyers list and distribution network for deals? So if we could find deals in cities all over the country, could we move them through our network? And I thought we could because we have, we probably in our mastermind group have an investor or two from just about every city, like bigger city in the US. So if we could get some of those deals without having to go really deep into one area, uh, could we roll out this kind of national um, wholesaling company? So that was that was one assumption, right? You do these uh, experiments, it's a hypothesis, and you've got these constants and variables, right? So that's one that we said, okay, that that's an assumption that I think we can make. Uh, I still think that's that's viable for me. And then the second one was, well, how would we make offers on properties all around the country? So the next step was, could we create and roll out and build an offer tool that would allow us to make an offer just by plugging in an address, right? So that was the next step. Okay, we're going to spend some money developing basically software to try to do that, tap into other APIs all over and see, could we, could we figure out how to do this? At, it wouldn't be perfect, but a reasonable rate of success and get as close enough to make offers. And then the, the third question was, well, if we could do all that, um, could we get rid of the sales reps? Because really it's just about making a volume number of offers at that point. Like, could we just, instead of making, you know, three or four or five offers a day, could we make a hundred offers a day? And if we can make a hundred offers a day, then even at a rate of, you know, a certain rate of success and failure, then we would be able to drastically increase the number of deals. So we kind of rolled all this out, like sketched it out and said, what kind of volume could we do? Could we get to a 10 million, maybe a $20 million company? And then what would that look like? And so that was the kind of plan that we operated off of for almost a year. So in the background, we were building this stuff while, um, while we were doing our normal business in our three, to, at that time it was five or six markets. We're in six markets. And so, um, so I was basically like funding and spending money, which I, I know you're probably speaking your language here on on future um, ideas and plans and development for like today. So it's today's money for future returns, which I've done plenty in the past. And we just got to a point where everything just kept getting pushed a little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit further. And I just didn't see 
the point at which, and, and by the way, this was pre-COVID. So we started doing this in January, 2020. And then in March or April of 2020 was around the time where there was, if, if everybody remembers, they might not because real estate's so great right now, right? There was like a time of about three months where people were like, the sky's falling, the hard money lenders dried up for a while. They, people weren't buying, they wanted COVID pricing and stuff like that. They thought the real estate market was going to totally crash and tank, right? And um, so as a wholesaler, those three months kind of dried up and kicked. It didn't, it didn't have contracts fall out. But what it did was it kicked the can down the road. People didn't want to move out of their house because they just didn't want to move. And people didn't want to move into a new house. I mean, you couldn't even go to a showing mm -hmm. because they were concerned that, you know, there was going to be a virus in the house, right, when you open the door. So all that happened. And then what it did was it kind of started, like, really crushing my cash flow as a business owner and putting me in. I didn't mind writing checks to keep all of my staff on at a time, but I just didn't want to do it for six, nine, 12 months. And we did. We we kept everybody on all the way through the pandemic, all of that stuff. And around October last year, around Flip Backing Live time, is just, just after that is when uh, my CEO and I had a discussion. But where can we go like, and pivot the company? And so um, I, not every plan works. Not every uh, thing that we, like, uh, not everything that we touch turns the gold, right? And so this was something that uh, just, I think based on everything that happened and all the different, um, all the different items, all the building blocks, it just was something that I had to make a difficult decision to kind of pull the plug on a project like that, that had a little over a quarter million dollars sunk into it. So, and nobody else is standing there holding the bag with me at that point. So I didn't I make a difficult decision to, to let some people go and make some adjustments in the company and just try to figure out what the next step was. Um, I think a lot of times, especially for me, I'm a very emotional decision maker. And I keep people longer than I should. I let things go further. I don't mind taking the hit and just letting other people continue to try to, you know, go the right direction and figure things out. So um, that's kind of what it was for us. And I figured we could kind of do, it's, it's, it's hard because you, you feel it when you feel like you can do 50 or 60 deals in your sleep. And I realize there's people that are listening and like, what the heck is this guy talking about? But if you imagine a professional football player, going from the pros to like high school football. I think they could do pretty well and do it very easily and probably not get hurt, right? And so we, I feel like we kind of got to the pros and then we, we took a step back and I just said, look, I, I really think that we could have a more streamlined team and just do 50 or 60 deals, like five deals a month and just not have like huge headaches. And I don't have to get involved. We. We don't have a bunch of, you know, when you have 20 people, inevitably somebody's going to quit or somebody's not going to do a great job. You're constantly hiring, onboarding, training, and that stuff's going to happen. And there's arguments to both sides. So that was it for us. Like long story, I think, but hopefully it helps. There's a lot of transparency there of um, we don't always do everything right. And as a business owner, you're the one that has to make the decision to kind of pull the plug in. Um, and make the tough decision to let people go, shut projects down and take a loss and kind of cut and run. And that's kind of where I ended up uh, in October and November of last year. And so for the, for the, the 50, 60 deals, are, are you talking about um, like wholesales? Or are you talking about fix and flip? What are you talking about? Yeah, primarily wholesales. We, we do wholesale a lot of stuff now. I mean, we can get into what the market's like right now. Um, a lot of times we are just cleaning stuff out real quick, like 1500 bucks or so on a couple dumpsters and uh, some paid labor to clean that back up on the MLS, even if it's cash only. And uh, we have the funds and we have the ability to close on just about anything now. So we do a lot of that, but we're really not like fixing and flipping anything. I mean, we just made $70,000 on a house that only wow. cost us 110 to buy. And you couldn't even get a loan on it. It didn't have any flooring upstairs. It was uh, needed a pool liners in pretty bad shape, but it was in a hot neighborhood that if we were 265 and the homeowner fixes it up, but for us, if we fixed it, we would have made the same amount of money. And I think a lot of that's happening right now. So um, being able to do some of that stuff is, is helpful, but that's that's 50 or 60 deals like that where we're not we're not actually swinging the hammer and doing three to six month renovations or even one month stuff. It's usually we're holding it in and out for a couple of weeks. And what is uh, the lead source? Are you guys, you know, MLS making offers? What are you what are you doing now? Yeah, we're we're I've primarily primarily been a direct mail and pay-per-click guy for almost like 
the whole time the last six years, seven years. Um, I still, we still do direct mail and it still works for us. Uh, I, I like it and I, we do a lot of kind of online advertising. Uh, we've been doing some like paid leads now, like buying leads as opposed to running our own pay-per-click uh, stuff. It's been working okay. Um, for us, we've got a couple bigger deals that way, uh, but we're kind of now looking at what's next for us might be going back to running our own pay-per-click campaigns again. Uh, Cause we kind of turned that off in October of last year. And, um, and went in on a more paid per lead type thing, let, which basically if anybody's listening, it's like letting somebody else run pay-per-click campaigns and you're buying leads from that thing. And, um, and so we're looking at that. And then now with, I brought on a partner recently, uh, about a month ago, and he, his business was all cold calling. So he's uh, ramping that up and he's getting about 15 leads a week just uh, from cold calling. He's got a couple of cold calling VAs that are pretty good at what they do. And they're driving a lot of traffic now to uh, from cold call. Nice. It's not my specialty, but it's his. <laughs> yeah, cold calling, man. I'll leave that to somebody else. Uh, even if you got yeah. VAs, that's like a interesting thing. All right, let's uh, let's start wrapping up a little bit. Uh, I think this, you know, the information has been really good, and and looking at, you know, what's going on. The the I, I think getting that information about or that that idea of taking action, right? Not like figuring out what you want to do and just figuring it out, doing it and, uh, and moving forward is how you've achieved the quick success and then transitioning when you need to transition um, and changing the way your business is. Uh, for, for people that, because Flip Hacking Live is coming up in October, right? And so this episode is probably coming out beginning of, of August. Um, I think that you guys have recordings of the, the previous years, don't you? We do. Yeah. We usually in the past, we, we don't even like sell them or give them away or anything like that. It's only been for uh, folks that uh, donate to the charity. So usually we bring a charity every year. And so if they donate to the charity, they get the recordings from the previous events. But yeah, we, we have those and they're, they're pretty awesome. Like some of the stuff that was shared last year about hiring and, um, and management of people and then marketing. We had Ryan Smith came in and talked about marketing. It's amazing. Uh, we had a, quite a few. And then the year before, we talked a lot about team, staff, hiring, training, stuff like that. It's That's the thing that I think that and marketing are the things that we get the most questions on. All right. Well, if I put you on the spot, I might have to edit this out, but <laughs> I put you on the spot and say if, if people sign up, uh, you know, at, uh, you know, for Flip Hacking Live, um, through, through a link or whatever, Flip Hacking Live slash Danny or something like that, would you be willing to give those, the recordings? Yes. All right. Yeah, so we can do have... the, we can do the, the last two years of recording. So that's what I, that's when I bought the company in 2019. Um, so our two, our last two events, 2019, 2020, we can do that. We can put a, like a membership uh, site together and stuff like that for, uh, for your audience. Yeah. Cool. Man, so that's like getting three three lives for the price of uh, one. Yeah, last year the VIP bonus for that event was to get the recordings right afterwards, and I think it was like, I think we charged like five or six hundred bucks for the recordings uh, oh, wow. for them. So, um, and I think the prices right now, the tickets are are three ninety seven, so it's even cheaper than buying the recordings from last year. So, yeah, oh, that's awesome. a good deal. And it's in Orlando. Yeah, it's in Orlando, October 14th, 15th, and 16th. It's at a resort about 20 minutes south of the Orlando airport. It's um, highly recommend you guys, if you're listening, if you're coming, you stay at the hotel. It's in kind of in the middle of, I won't say in the middle of nowhere, but it's a resort type hotel. They got like Lazy River golf courses. It's the um, uh, Champions Gate, Omni Champions Gate Hotel, really beautiful place. But a lot of the networking and things that happen in the hotel are just as important as uh, some of the presentations that you'll see. I've seen people do deals together, raise a bunch of money, all kinds of stuff from uh, spending time. We go, we start a little bit early and we kind of go late most nights. So I highly recommend you guys stay there at the hotel too. Yeah. Even for an introvert, I think, you know, going to those, and even if you just make a couple friends, you know, that are, you know, making changes in their business and doing things and then keeping those relationships and communicating with them and then having people to bounce ideas off of, you know, that, that come from things like that are really incredible. And then the chance to, to see Bill walking around and just grabbing him and, and talking with him and becoming friends with him because that's what he's there for and does. And, you know, when that first mastermind, when, when we met, you know, I was, 
I, I, I hardly ever really went anywhere. Like I was just doing deals in San Antonio and I didn't really talk to that many people. I didn't even go to Ria's. And so going there and then, you know, you acting so, so uh, interested about, you know, the fact that I wrote that book and you read that it was, was really cool. But, um, but it made me nervous. I was like, man, he's, he's going to find out that I'm not really a rock star, but well, uh, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're a pretty sarcastic guy. You were a pilot, a successful real estate investor, um, uh, amazing software developer, like it, getting to know you is one of the highlights of this group. And there's so many other people just like that. Like I, I, I made some amazing friends, connections, and um, I remember the first Go Back and Live that I went to. It was two weeks before my son was going to be born, and um, I had the opportunity to speak there, and I couldn't turn it down. And it really kind of just changed my my business and my life. Like it's totally, I, I wouldn't be where I am right now without attending that event. And so many times that we hear that, that's why we put so much work into it. It's seven months of work, mm -hmm. and we'll probably spend upwards of a million dollars on this event. Uh, with, you know, I'm not knowing if people are going to come and show up and spend money on tickets. So uh, somebody asked me one time at their event, they said, if, if I was going to spend a million dollars and invite you to the million dollar party that I was throwing, why wouldn't you go? Like, why? It's cost $300 to go to a million dollar party. Like, go, you know, you never know what you're going to find there. And uh, it, it's, it's hard when you, like, I'm, I'm in a unique position because I, I, I was a member of this of this group, like a paying member for years before I bought it. So I feel like I can speak a little bit differently than a founder of something like that. Um, it's just an amazing community of people. And I, I always tell people like, we will attract people that are like us with our characters and our traits and our values and things like that. So if you're listening to this and you you feel like, you know, I, and, and Danny, uh, you know, I'm attracted to Danny because of that, like your values are why we're friends and and who you are. And if if that's the case, then, Come, you know, network with a bunch of other people that are just like that, like the dreamers, the kind of crazy 1% type folks. And uh, I don't know, there's something there for sure. So. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I think that there, we could speak all day long about all the benefits and all that kind of stuff. You know, instead, let's let's say, you know, who's it not for? Yeah, I, so I, yeah I think, I think if, if you're looking for like to get rich quick that kind of stuff, um, you're looking to find, you know, I, I don't know, like, you, I had a lady come up to me a couple of years ago and said, you know what? You know, it's weird. I go to these things with my husband all the time, but I haven't heard a cuss word the whole time that I was here. And usually it's really bad language. It's, it's kind of chauvinistic type events and things like that. And it's not like that here. This is, it's, it's different. So I, I'm, I'm not saying that if you have a foul mouth or you like to party really hard not to come, but it's, it's really just, it, it's very family friendly and it's, it's just, I, I, it's hard to say who it's not for without kind of, I, what I will say is if, if the way that we talk and um, what we talk about and the values are important to you, then it's for you. If, if you're like, I just am doing this to get rich really fast and I want to screw people over and um, you know, I don't care if I drop this contract because it's really not that important to me. I'll just go get four more and I'll, tell sellers, you know, I'll go put a high offer in and then renegotiate two days later, every time, um, that kind of stuff. And it's yeah, the, the, you know, poster child for sleazy real estate investor. And that's kind of what you're attracted to and who you want to be, then it's not for you. But I don't think anybody listens to that podcast that, that is this podcast is like that either. So it's, um, I don't know, new real estate investors, um, seasoned real estate, there, there's something for, for somebody who's never done a deal and somebody who's doing hundreds of deals. Like there's, there's somebody there who's doing more than you. And there's probably somebody there who's doing less than you. And they're all getting value, just a different way. You know, so I always tell people, you should come every year. And just that one thing that you get may change your marriage, may change your business, may change kind of the future of your life. So, uh, or the way you talk to your kids, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. It's very, it's, there's an intrinsic value to all of this that you can't really put a, a tag on. So I don't know if I answered your question, but um, it's no, not for you if you don't want to come hang out with me or people like me. Or you're wearing a suit that has dollar signs all over it. <laughs> Unless it's a joke, because I can see damage. <laughs> it's like, I have to say it too. When Bill got on the Zoom call for this, I was, <laughs> I was just, I just had lunch and I had a piece of cake, which I hardly ever do. And so I was just like, man, I need to wake up. I need to do something funny. And I've been, you know, just a weird thing, but he, he got on the Zoom call and I was shirtless, just sitting here waiting for him behind a microphone. 
But uh, anyway, I, I think you were like drinking a cup of coffee or something like yeah. that. It looked, uh, I just started laughing and <laughs> hilarious. I would expect nothing less from. Yeah. Right. All right. So anyway, that's just, we creep some people out just then, which is cool. All right. And before Bill changes his mind, if what, what's it going to be flip hacking live? Go, yeah. Go to flip hacking live.com slash Danny. And okay. we'll, uh, we'll set that up for you guys. So flip hacking live.com slash Danny. And um, we'll, we'll put something, we'll put a page together over the next, I don't know, a couple of days before this comes out for you. So it'll, it should have all the bonuses and stuff on there um, that you guys can see. If you have any questions, there should be an email address on there. You can uh, shoot it over to us and ask. Nice. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the Bill, uh, the Bill show, the show, Bill. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's been fun. All right. Man, keep in touch. See ya.